A very good evening viewers and aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis brought to you by Shankarais Academy for the date 24th of November 2021. These are the list of news articles that I have taken for discussion today. Today we are going to discuss about one editorial and one data point. This editorial is based on the recent India-US trade policy forum. And in this discussion we are going to discuss about a central sector scheme called as Prashad. And then in this next discussion, we are going to discuss about a new scheme announced by the government in the railway sector. And finally, we are going to discuss about a new bank that was established by the government in 2021. So along with that, we have the practice prelims questions discussion. In this discussion, I also have a quiz question. So pay attention to the discussions today. The quiz question has been framed on today's discussion. And finally, we have a mains question discussion also. So, with this introduction, let us move on to first news article discussion. So, today we are going to start our news article analysis with the hot topic of the day, which is the India-US Trade Policy Forum. See these two news articles, that is one is this news article from the front page and this editorial. Both these talk about this trade policy forum that was convened yesterday. This trade policy forum has been revived after four years. And remember, this trade policy forum is co-chaired by Indian Ministry of uh, Commerce and Industry along with the United States Trade Representative. This trade policy forum serves as a primary bilateral mechanism for pursuing India-US shared trade and investment objectives. So, it is an important forum in the India-US trade relations. In this regard, let us discuss about the decisions taken at this trade policy forum that is mentioned in these two articles. And along with this, we'll also see the trends of India-US trade relation over the years. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. So first, let us see the India-US trade relation over the years. Now, if you look at this representation or this graph, it shows us India-US trade relations. And as you can see here, it mentions about the exports, imports, etc. And you can find that India has surplus trade with USC. So when we say surplus trade, it means we are exporting more than what we are importing from that particular country. So if we have surplus trade with USA, it means we are exporting more to the US than what India is importing from USA. You can see here the exports is given in the blue bar and imports is red bar and the trade surplus is green bar. This is another representation here also you can see how the trade between India and US has grown over two decades and you can see that the trade from India to US is more compared to the trade from US to India. So in this manner you should remember that US is the top destination for Indian exports. It contributes to about 16 percentage of total exports from India and in case of imports US is the second largest after China. US contributes 7 percentage of imports. So both of these make the US the largest trading partner for India and it shows that there is more potential to grow. So in this context only the trade policy forum that was convened yesterday is important and mainly this forum resolved to take necessary steps to take India to the next highest level on the trade front. So initially we saw that the trade policy forum is meeting after four years right. So in these four years, a lot of matters relating to trade has happened between India and USA. And in a way, we can say that this recent trade policy forum has also stepped on certain measures to overturn some of the events that happened in those four years. So let us see what happened in these four years first, and then we'll see the decisions taken at this forum. See, first, we should address that in these four years, USA was under Mr. Trump's administration. And at that time, initially, India-US were set to incur free trade agreement. But due to a failure of trade talks, both the countries were not even able to conclude a mini trade deal at the end of Trump administration. So this was the first issue. And then there was also the issue of uh, increased import tariffs. See, what happened was under the Trump administration, new tariffs were applied in 2018 on steel and aluminium imports from dozens of countries and India was also one among them and this was done under 
a national security exemption in US trade law now in response to this new tariff india also imposed retaliatory tariffs for us products like uh, almonds walnuts cashews apples chickpeas wheat and peas etc and india filed these retaliatory tariffs with the world trade organization so that means there were tariffs from both the ends and then comes the issue of gsp that is generalized system of preferences of usa the issue was that usa withdrew benefits to indian exports under its gsp that is usa suspended gsp eligibility to india so what is this gsp it is a us trade program this trade program was instituted on 1976 by us trade act of 1974 this gsp is designed to promote development in developing countries to help in development this gsp offers uh, preferential duty free entry for up to 4800 products so that means to these products there is duty free entry so these products in the us market will have lesser price compared to the products from other countries that do not get this preferential status so that means through this gsp the developing countries can competitively access the us market and it helps to boost their exports also but as we saw the trump administration removed india from gsp program so the indian exporters were worried that their products won't stay competitive in the us market then finally came the recent developments like uh, the exit of uh, major american businesses for example recently ford exited india before that harley davidson exited from indian market so even though this is not directly linked to india us trade policies but their exit has not helped the india us relations rather it has strained these relations so these are some of the major events that happened in the last 4 years when the trade policy forum was not active so in this backdrop only the tpf that is the trade policy forum has been revived so now let us see the decisions taken at this trade policy forum so first of all it has decided to forge an agreement to facilitate us market access to certain products from india these products are the agricultural producers like mangoes grapes and pomegranate and on the other hand india also has to reciprocate with similar access to indian market to the products from the usa and these products includes cherries pork and alfalfa hay for animal feed then apart from this it was also agreed that discussion will be held on resolving market access concerns for water buffalo meat and wild caught shrimp from india then next discussion was with respect to the gsp that is generalized system of preferences see in the post covid world usa looks at india as a key partner in rebuilding usa's supply chain along with this usa is also seeking to reduce its over dependence on china so in this way india can play a significant role so stating such facts indian side has proposed the restoration of gsp india claimed that this restoration will not only benefit india but it will also benefit usa and industries from both the sides because they will be able to integrate their supply chain efficiently by then then the forum also agreed on the significance of negotiating a social security totalization agreement this was considered in the interest of workers from both sides see this social security totalization agreement is an international tax treaty Actually USA has entered into this agreement with several nations for the purpose of avoiding double taxation of income with respect to social security taxes in simple terms we can say that this agreement seeks to remove dual taxation now this agreement between India and USA has been in discussion for over a decade and now the discussions are continuing and now they have agreed on the significance of this negotiation now when finally this agreement is implemented then it will help workers from both the countries then apart from that regarding the pharmaceutical sector also certain decisions and concerns were discussed for example we know that indian pharma exports account for 40% of the usa's generic drug supply but however there was a delay in us regulatory inspection of pharma units in india so this delayed india's pharma exports and has been a concern for indian pharma companies and this delay in inspection from the side of usa was due to the complication created by pandemic and therefore in this trade policy forum this concern of india was acknowledged by the 
United States Trade Representative and the US chair has pledged to pursue constructive dialogue on this matter. Next, both sides also underlined the importance of India-US trade and economic partnership in addressing global challenges also. So on those lines, both the sides agreed to work closely and constructively in relevant multilateral trade bodies, including the World Trade Organization and the G20 Forum. This will help in enhancing the bilateral trade relationship of both the countries. And both sides also agreed to work for achieving a shared vision of transparent rules-based global trading system among the market economies and democracies. Then USA also noted its support for India's ambitious goal regarding climate change. This goal was with respect to ethanol blending petrol. We know that India has a goal of reaching 20% ethanol blending petrol by 2025. And on these lines, USA has expressed an interest in supplying ethanol to India for fuel purposes. Both sides agree to explore ways for enhancing collaboration for the implementation of their respective ethanol blending programs also. So this support by USA will be of great help to India to reduce its carbon intensity of Indian economy. So if you remember, in the COP26 that was concluded very recently, our Prime Minister told that by the year 2030, India will reduce the carbon intensity of its economy by 45%. So this support from USA will help India in achieving this particular goal. Then apart from all these matters, the delegates also exchanged views on harnessing the vast potential of digital trade to boost economic growth and innovation. Both sides also pledged to deepen bilateral engagement for promoting digital economy. They also said they would explore the adoption of joint principles that would ensure that internet remains open for free exchange of ideas, goods and services. And finally, both the sides agreed to further engage for finding a mutually agreed solution or solutions on the outstanding World Trade Organization disputes that is existing between the countries. So we can say that this is a welcome step because the dispute in WTO between India and USA is a major problem in India-US trade relations. So if they agree to find mutually agreed solutions, then it will be a step further in enhancing this trade relationship of both countries. So these were some of the matters and concerns in various sectors that were discussed in the Trade Policy Forum. And with this, we have come to the end of this discussion. See, in today's discussion, we understood about the Trade Policy Forum and we saw what were the events that occurred in the past four years when this Trade Policy Forum was not active. Then we saw the discussions in the forum related to market access, GSP issue, Social Security uh, totalization agreement. We saw issues in pharma sector and we understood that both the sides have agreed to involve in a constructive dialogue to solve these issues. So now let us move on to the next discussion. This discussion is based on this news article which talks about a particular scheme. Let us see what the news is first. The news is about a criticism on the development plan in Karnataka that has been framed under the Prashad scheme of central government. See this development plan is for the Chamundi hills that is situated in Mysuru and the Chamundi Hills is proposed to be developed under this Prashad scheme. Now the critics argue that such development plan is environmentally unsustainable because the plan aims to build architecture using concrete and other unsustainable materials. And they also fear that such development plan will increase the footfall in the Chamundi Hills and it will increase the anthropogenic pressure. So now why such a development plan has been proposed for Chamundi Hills? Now, to understand this, we need to understand this Prashad scheme and then we'll see some details regarding the Chamundi Hills also. Now, first of all, note that the full name of the scheme is National Mission on Pilgrimage Rejuvenation and Spiritual Heritage Augmentation Drive. It is a central sector scheme. That means the scheme is fully financed by the Government of India. Now, this scheme was launched by the Ministry of Tourism in the year 2014-15. to Now, the objective of the scheme is integrated development of identified pilgrimage and heritage destinations. So under this objective, 
The scheme aims at providing well-planned tourism infrastructure and such tourism infrastructure focuses on enabling tourist convenience, accessibility, security, cleanliness, tourist experience etc. And therefore, the overall aim is to provide a complete religious tourism experience as well as boosting the economic growth and sustainable development of those destinations. Now, this in turn will give boost to the employment generation for the local communities in that region. So, what are all the infrastructure development taken up under this scheme? The infrastructure developments include entry points, then it provides last mile connectivity, then basic tourism facilities like information and interpretation centers are built under this scheme, then ATM machines or money exchange centers are also set up in these areas, then Along with this parking, drinking water, toilets, waiting room, first aid centers, all these are set up as part of infrastructure development in the destination regions. But why is such a scheme is necessary? Why there is a need to focus on infrastructure development? See, we know that India is blessed with rich and diverse cultural and spiritual heritage because India is a land of many religions and therefore we also have many centers of pilgrimage for various faiths. Now, to experience such heritage, millions of tourists from the domestic regions and also from international places come to India. So, such cultural and spiritual heritage destinations provide a tourism potential. Now, to tap this tourism potential, there was a need for integrated development of selected pilgrimage destinations and an integrated development of the heritage cities. And in this manner, this Prashad scheme offers a tremendous opportunity to undertake infrastructure developments in such sites because infrastructure is important to boost tourism. And under the scheme, central finance assistance is given to the state governments or even territory administrations or even to the central agencies for development of these infrastructure, particularly infrastructure related to pilgrimage tourism and heritage tourism. So we can see that there are two components of this scheme. One is the development of pilgrimage tourism and another is the development of heritage tourism. Now how these destinations are selected? See the pilgrimage destinations are selected on the basis of pilgrimage lineage and also based on the pilgrimage footfall. See here footfall is important because it gives an idea about the number of tourists who are visiting that particular destination. And in case of a pilgrimage it also provides us about the importance of that pilgrimage on the national pilgrimage map. Now coming to the selection of heritage cities, there are many criteria considered under this also. For example, they are selected on the basis of high heritage values of the city, then based on the tourist footfall, then also based on number of monuments and their accreditation. So here also tourist footfall is important because as we saw, it gives an idea about the number of tourists visiting that particular destination and tells us how popular that city is. And now number of monuments is important because heritage value of that city depends on the availability of tangible heritage assets and intangible heritage resources in that region. Now coming to the accreditation part, we know that the historic destinations and monuments in our country are accredited internationally and also nationally. Internationally, it is accredited by UNESCO and nationally, it is done by Archaeological Survey of India. So, this criteria helps us to prioritize one heritage city over the other. So, now these are the criteria based on which the heritage cities and the pilgrimage destinations are chosen. Now, after their selection, the respective states and even territories, they prepare an integrated plan. Now, this integrated plan is submitted to the National Integrated Plan Approval Committee, in short IPAC. This National IPAC is a committee chaired by the Secretary of Ministry of Tourism. So, therefore, this National IPAC is the final approval authority for the integrated plans for the pilgrimage destinations and integrated developments of heritage cities. Now, in this manner only, recently in October, the Karnataka government got in principle approval for the rejuvenation of Chamundi Hills in Mysuru under this Prashad scheme. So that means this place is considered as a place of heritage and pilgrimage importance. Let us see why. See mainly because it has many pilgrimage centers atop the hill. For example, we can find the Chamundeshwari temple which is situated on the top of this Chamundi hill. This temple is dedicated to Goddess Sri Chamundeshwari. So we can understand that this hill got the name from this temple only. 
and note that krishna raja vadayar 3 built a gopura to this temple with gold finials as we know vadayar dynasty ruled mysore or before and after tipu sultan now apart from this chamundeshwari temple we can also find another important temple which is the shri mahabaleshwara temple and it is said that this temple was built before the beginning of hoysala rule in mysore then another attraction in the chamundi hill is a nandi statue we know that nandi is a mythological figure based on hindu mythology and is considered as lord shiva's vehicle now this nandi statue situated on the chamundi hills is a huge nandi and it is one of the largest in india it is about uh, 16 feet tall at the front and 25 feet in the length and it is said that dodda devaraja vadayar was responsible for the creation of this colossal bull so because of these heritage cultural and spiritual importance chamundi hills was chosen as a place for rejuvenation under the prasad scheme and it also got in principle approvals from the central government recently and that is why now critics are saying that this place might come under anthropogenic pressure if this development continues in the manner it is proposed to so let us wait and see what decision is taken by the karnataka government and the central government so in this discussion we saw about an important scheme that focuses on boosting the pilgrimage and heritage tourism in our country and we also saw some of the important details about the chamundi hills in mysore now let us move on to the next discussion our next discussion is going to be based on this data point which provides us with certain data based on the asr report that is the annual status of education report that was released for the year 2021 This report was released recently and it covered various dimensions about the schooling status of children across rural India. I note that this particular data point focuses on one major dimension that was highlighted in the report. This dimension is the trends of private coaching during the pandemic times. So, in this discussion, we are going to discuss about this Asar report and also the findings related to this private coaching during the pandemic times. the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference first of all asr stands for annual status of education report it is a citizen led household survey this report is released by an organization called pratham foundation every year this report focuses on children's schooling and learning status i note that under this report schooling status is recorded for children in the age group of 3 to 16 years and for the children in the age group of 5 to 16 years they are tested for their ability to read simple text and do basic arithmetic another important fact to be remembered about this report is that it is a rural survey so urban areas are not covered i note that this report has been published since 2005 except for the year 2015 and this time the survey was conducted in 25 states three union territories and overall 581 districts so in this manner this report explores various areas in education such as children's enrollment paid tuition classes smartphones learning support at home access to and availability of learning materials and it also deals with some additional areas like uh, engagement and challenges in learning covid prevention measures etc but as we already said this data point focuses on one particular dimension which is the private coaching during pandemic see this dimension includes the data on the paid academic tuition which were taken by children who are between the age of 5 to 16 and this dimension has taken into consideration both the online tuition and also in person private tuition but it has excluded the tuition classes on uh, dance music sports etc so according to the findings of this report overall the incidence of tuition has increased across almost all states but why the sudden increase there are certain reasons for this let us see these reasons first then we'll see the data related to it see the first reason is that private tuition is a natural response to the prolonged school closure see children they have to learn some way so many parents opt for private tuition and one of the main reasons for this is the second reason which is the fact that parents from rural areas are less educated or sometimes they are illiterate in most cases so they rely on private tuitions for the education of their child and third reason is that parents were only able to access tuition classes because 
the economic disruptions caused by the pandemic have moved children out of the private schools so even though the private schools were able to conduct online classes the parents were not in a position to pay for those private schools so they were able to pay for private tuitions and they enrolled their children in government schools in many cases now the final reason is that the parents were able to pay to the private tuitions due to the fact that the tuition classes are a local phenomenon so the payment for these classes may be adjusted flexibly and quickly based on the demand and supply and such payment could be negotiated between the tutor and the family but this kind of negotiation is not possible with a private school so because of these reasons overall the incidence of tuition has increased across almost all states so let us see some data related to these facts see first of all if you look at this representation here we can find the percentage of children taking tuition and we can see that there is an increase in 2021 compared to 2018 and 2020 levels in all grades and this increase was even present in students from both the government and private schools as you can see here there is a significant amount of increase in 2021 levels compared to 2018 and 2020 levels among the children who are enrolled in government and private schools and then if we take the gender aspect here also we can find that there is an upward trend we can see that there is a significant increase in the number of boys and girls who are enrolled in tuition in the year 2021 compared to 2018 and 2020 but this trend of increase in private paid tuitions is found to come down with the reopening of schools that is the students were found to be more engaged in uh, private tuitions when the schools remained closed but when the schools started reopening then the number of students engaging in private tuitions have come down this could be interpreted from this table there is a significant decrease and then the report also has data on the percentage of students who have opted for private tuitions based on their parents education so in this data you can see that it has considered parents education in three levels that is low level medium and high level low parental education includes families where both parents have completed standard 5 or less and high parental education category comprises families where both parents have completed at least class 9 and all other parents are in the medium category so we can see that the share of children who are taking tuitions are found to be more among the high parental education category compared to the low and medium parental education category so this goes against our uh, reasoning that the children of parents who have less education or who are illiterate they opt for private tuitions and this trend is consistent even in 2018 and 2020 that means the children of parents who are in the high category of education they are enrolled in tuitions that is private tuitions so these are the trends we can see relating to private tuitions now if we take the overall trend or the state wise trend then we can see that in many states the share of children in private tuitions is more than the all india average for example it is more in arunachal pradesh nagaland jharkhand odisha bihar manipur west bengal etc but comparatively this is less in states like telangana chatisgarh tamil nadu kerala rajasthan etc now we know that kerala is a state having the highest literacy rate in our country and maybe because of this students enrolled in private tuition is low in this state and it could also be found that among all the surveyed states kerala was the only state where the share of students using private coaching fell in the survey period it has reduced by 9.4 percentage from 2018 to 2021 so these are some of the important facts that you need to know with respect to paid tuition these facts will be important for you in your essay writing regarding any questions on education especially how pandemic has affected the education sector so now let us move on to the next discussion now our next discussion is going to be based on this news article which talks about the bharat gaurav scheme see the ministry of railways has announced this Bharat Gaurav scheme so today let us see few facts related to the scheme and we'll also see the benefit of such a scheme so first of all what is this Bharat Gaurav scheme so it is a scheme under which theme based tourist circuit trains are to be run by private or state owned operators so these 
tourist circuit trains will be on the lines of Ramayana Express. We know that this Ramayana Express covers a distance of more than 7,500 kilometers, and it uh, takes pilgrims to places such as uh, Ayodhya, Prayag, Nandigram, Janakpur, Hampi, Rameshwaram, etc. So these tourist circuit trains that are to be run under Bharat Gaura scheme will be on the lines of Ramayana Express. So there are certain conditions under this scheme. Let us see these conditions now. First of all, who will be the service provider under this scheme? See, it can be an individual, company, society, trust, joint venture or consortium. Any of these could be the service providers under this scheme. And the service providers have the discretion to decide the theme of the circuit trains. For example, Guru Kripa train will be covering important places of Sikh culture. So like this, the service providers can decide on the theme. Along with this, the service providers can also offer all inclusive packages to the tourists like uh, they can provide rail travel, hotel accommodation, sightseeing arrangement, visit to historical sites or heritage sites. They can provide tour guides, etc. And then full flexibility is also given for the service providers to decide on the package cost based on level of services that is being offered in such trains. And then the service providers are also free to design and furnish the interior of coaches based on the theme. And it is said that they can use the inside and the outside of the train for branding and advertisement. And also the service providers have a choice in selecting the coaches for addressing different segments like luxury and budget. And according to the scheme, the train composition will be of 14 to 20 coaches, including two guard vans. See, guard van is the small railway carriage that is usually at the back of the train in which the guard travels. So these are the conditions under this scheme. Now, along with this, the strength of professionals of the uh, tourism sector will also be used for this scheme. They will be used to identify and develop the tourist circuits and they will also be used to run these theme-based trains so as to tap the vast tourism potential of our country. And further, along with the passenger segment and the goods segment of the railways, a third segment of tourism, Bharat Gauru trains, will also be included. And these Bharat Gauru trains will not be regular trains that will run as per the timetable, but they will be more like the Ramayana Express that is being currently run by the IRCTC. And note that currently the railway ministry has allocated uh, more than 3,000 coaches or 150 trains for Bharat Gaurav scheme and the ministry is taking applications from today onwards. Now the ministry will also set up customer support units for the smooth implementation of this scheme. So now what are the benefits of this scheme? First of all, it will help to unleash India's tourism potential. See, this scheme will showcase India's rich cultural heritage and magnificent historical places to the people of India and to the people from around the world. And then we saw that it allows the entry of both government and private players into the scheme. So that means the scheme will aid in increase in competition and therefore the services offered to the customers will be comparatively good and they will be provided at competitive cost. And then under the scheme, tourism professionals will also be involved. So this will help the industry experts to fully understand the potential of the sector and to help the railways in developing profitable circuits. So like this, this scheme could be milked for its benefits. And this is again another scheme from the side of the government for boosting the tourism sector. In this discussion, we briefly understood about the Bharat Gauru scheme that has been announced by the railway ministry recently. And we saw some of the conditions under this scheme and what are the benefits of such a scheme. Now let us move to the next discussion. Now, our last discussion for the day is going to be based on this news article from the business page. This article talks about NABFID, that is the National Bank for Financing Infrastructure and Development. So, here the news is that this institution is likely to begin its lending operations and it will be lending to 190 to 200 big infrastructure projects in various sectors like railways, roads and energy. So, in this regard, it is important for us to know about this bank. See, it is a new development financial institution. It was established in the month of March 2021 by an Act of Parliament. The Act is the National Bank for Financing Infrastructure and Development Act and its head office is in Mumbai. Now, this institution is set up as a corporate body. 
and it is given an authorized share capital of 100,000 rupees. And note that initially the central government will own 100% shares of this institution, but this share will be reduced up to 26% subsequently. So now what are the objectives of this institution? See, it has two kinds of objectives. One is developmental and the other one is financial. Now when we talk about the developmental objectives, it includes the role of this bank to facilitate relevant institutions to support the development of long-term non-recourse infrastructure financing in our country. That is, it will be facilitating the development of uh, market for bonds, loans and derivatives for the infrastructure financing. Now we are saying non-recourse infrastructure because the infrastructure projects are characterized by non-recourse or limited recourse financing. This means that lenders can only be repaid from the revenues generated by this project. And it will be a long term financing because the gestation period for the projects under this sector is much longer. Now the financial objective is that it is directed to lend or invest either directly or indirectly and it is also directed to attract investment from private sector investors and institutional investors and they can invest in the infrastructure projects which are located in India or which are located partly in India and partly outside India. So now what about its management? See this institution will be governed by a board of directors and the chairperson of this board will be appointed by the central government in consultation with the Reserve Bank of India. So now why do we need such a bank? What is its significance? See mainly such a body will help in catalyzing the investments in the fund starved infrastructure sector of our country and then it will also facilitate major plans of the government in the infrastructure sector. For example, this institution will start by looking at the projects under national infrastructure pipeline which are about 1000 crore each. So that means setting up of this bank is a turning point in building Indian infrastructure for the next few decades. Because as we already said, infrastructure sector is fund start. That is, there is perennial shortage of infrastructure capital. So even if we take the example of a national infrastructure pipeline, it has also got concerns about the existence of fiscal constraints. But now, such critical gap of financing will be addressed through the financing by this institution. So the major benefit of this bank is that it will boost the infrastructure sector. So these are some of the points that you need to know about uh, National Bank for Financing Infrastructure and Development. So with this discussion, we are moving to the next session, which is the practice questions discussion session. Now look at this first question. It is a pair based question. The question says, consider the following sites identified under the Prashad scheme. So on one side, sites are given and on the other side, corresponding states are given. You have to choose the correctly matched pairs. First pair is Kamakya, Arunachal Pradesh. So this is a temple, Kamakya temple, and it is not situated in Arunachal Pradesh, but it is in Assam. So this pair is incorrect. Now the second pair, Parashuram Kund, Uttarakhand. This pair is also not correct because Parashuram Kund is in Lohit district of Arunachal Pradesh. Now the next pair is Velangani, Tamil Nadu. Now this is a correctly matched pair. It is situated in Tamil Nadu. See this place is famous for the Velangani church, which is a Christian pilgrim shrine and the name of the place is also Velangani. It is situated in Nagapadnam district of Tamil Nadu. Now let us not go into details about just know in which states these sites belong to. So totally under the Prashad scheme 41 sites in 25 states have been identified. Here is the list of these sites. Just know the sites and the states to which they belong to. So the correct answer to this question is option D 3 only. Now this next question is based on IRCTC. Consider the following statements regarding Indian Railway Catering and Tourism Corporation. First statement, it is wholly owned subsidiary of Government of India through Indian Railways. So this statement is incorrect because now IRCTC is not a wholly owned subsidiary of Government of India. Initially it was so but in 2019 IRCTC was listed on the National Stock Exchange and after that Government of India's holdings in IRCTC was reduced and currently it is 67%. So first statement is incorrect. The moment you know this, you can easily arrive at the correct answer which is option B, 2 and 3 only. 
Now let us see the second statement. It is a Mini Ratna Category One company. This statement is correct. This Mini Ratna Category One status was conferred on IRCTC in 2008. Now let us look at the third statement. Its four business segments are internet ticketing, catering, packaged drinking water, and travel and tourism. This statement is also correct. These are the four business segments of IRCTC. And additionally, know that IRCTC operates several trains as a private player in India. These trains include the Lucknow New Delhi Tejas Express. Then we have the Ahmedabad Mumbai Central uh, Tejas Express. Then we have the Kashi Mahakal Hamsafar Express, which is running between Indore and Varanasi. So the correct answer is option B. Now with these prelims practice question, I have this quiz question for you. This question has been framed based on the uh, National Bank for Financing Infrastructure and Development discussion of today. It is a three statement question. Read read each statement carefully and then you can write the answer to this question in the comment section. I will tell you whether your answer is right or not. Now let us take the main question for today. This question has been framed based on the India-US uh, trade relations. It is a GS2 question. You have to answer this question in 250 words. So here the question also asks you to list the steps that has been taken in the forum. So you can allot a significant part of your answer to this second half of the question. Interest aspirants can write answer to this question and post it in the comment section. And whenever we get time, we'll review your answer. So viewers, I hope you found our discussion helpful. If you like this video, don't forget to like, comment and share. And do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil services preparation. Thank you.